Um, you mother! Did you guys hear that? What the? Yeah. <laughs> you got pissed off the moment I. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> no, you better! No! Oh my god! <laughs> no! What the f? Uh oh. Gerardo, what the f? <laughs> I've been on a few movie sets, some more high end than others. Um, we actually had a movie set of our own that we did. We uh, we paid for a production, and I got to be honest, didn't really anything. Nothing really went bad outside of a uh, outside of us having to move the uh, uh, the tent that we had set up on the outside back inside so that we could uh, so that we could film inside or so that we could film in the tent all day and didn't have to worry about the sun literally ruining every shot, which was a pain in the ass because me and Jake spent so much time trying to make sure that the damn thing would, would work outside and we set it up outside. But then all of a sudden it was like, Oh wait, no, we actually have to go inside now. I'm like, Oh, for God's sake. and anyway, that was the whole thing. But yeah, outside of uh, that, Everything went fairly smooth. Yeah. We went back for reshoots about a few weeks later. And again, everything just went so well. I can't really think of anything that was truly horrific or horrifying. Yeah, thankfully. Yeah. But on movie sets, there are some very horrifying things that have occurred. Um, the one that I can really think of off the top of my head that resulted in... A very high-profile death was the Twilight Zone movie. Did you ever hear about that? I don't think so. The Twilight Zone movie, when it was being made, uh, there was a scene that was being filmed. What happened was the helicopter, uh, the back uh, blade, got caught on a on a wire or on a uh, cable that was being used for a camera rig system. Oh shit! And it basically knocked out that propeller the thing spun out of control and it crashed into the ground and here was the big problem it crashed on top of the lead actor and the two children that were that were in the scene oh damn and killed all three of them <clears throat> and actually there's ca the camera footage that was recovered from the scene dude it, they go frame by frame, and you can see the helicopter blade decapitate Ooh. all three of them Jesus! in one swipe. You see, and you see it. So it wasn't just that they got crushed by the helicopter, the blades hit them? Yes. Damn. It's literally one of the, more, one of the worst incidents ever to happen on a film set. There's others out there. I know that uh, there was More a... recently, the Alec Baldwin situation. Oh, that one? Dude, that one sucks like, on multiple levels because, you know, the accident, it, it happened because of pure negligence. I had a thing about that saved on my phone, but I think I deleted it. It was basically like me finding out that Alec Baldwin shot someone on set. And it's like, dang, that's fucked up, Alec Baldwin. Me finding out that it was actually... The fault of the guy that was hired, uh, um, that was over the props that the gun had ammo in it. And it's like, damn, that's fucked up of that guy that was hired. And it's like me finding out that the guy was hired due to the production company wanting to cut, uh, due to the producers wanting to cut funds and cut corners. And it's like, damn, that's fucked up to the producers. Me finding out that the producer was Alec Baldwin. Damn, that's fucked up, Alec Baldwin. <laughs> <laughs> Needless to say, Film sets are no joke sometimes, especially when you're, especially on a hot set where a lot of bad shit can happen. So we have here uh, Mr. Nightmare with horrifying things that happened on horror movie sets, and uh, yeah, I wonder what kind of uh, wonder what kind of stuff he's gonna bring up. So I guess without further ado, let's hop right in. Here we go. A lot of horror movies are legitimately scary. But in some cases, the events that took place on the sets of certain horror movies were more terrifying than the movies themselves. A number of horrifying incidents have taken place on the sets of some of the most successful horror movies of all time, before, during, or shortly after filming. 
Whether these incidents were fatal accidents, cruel twists of fate, or some sort of evil curse. It's funny to me that when she has her hair out of her eyes, she just looks kind of like she's playing, uh, uh, shoot, Lydia Dietz in pajamas. (laughs) (laughs) place to start would be the Amityville Horror House, oh. whose events may start to seem even scarier when you learn that horrors also took place on the sets for both the 1979 movie and the 2005 remake. The first Amityville movie starred James Brolin, who wasn't originally eager to take on the role, but eventually he accepted it because of something strange that happened. While reading the script one morning and getting to a scary section of the story, a pair of the actor's pants suddenly fell off a hanger, causing him to literally jump out of his chair in fright. <laughs> James, of course, saw this as a sign that he needed to take the role, and the rest was history. It's like, if my Best pants can scare me while I'm reading it, it'll scare the pants off the audience. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I guess that was probably James's logic. 2005 remake, with Ryan Reynolds taking on the part that was originally played by James Brolin. During filming, Ryan Reynolds, along with other <clears> cast <throat> members, claimed that every morning, at exactly 3.15 a.m., they would wake up. The reason why that's terrifying is because 3.15 a.m. was the exact time that Ronald DeFeo murdered his entire family in the house, and it becomes a whole lot more creepy. At one point during filming, there was also an actual dead body that washed up near the filming set in the boathouse in the backyard of the house. Actors and crew members always suspected that there was an otherworldly presence during the filming of the movie. Whether they were right or just overly paranoid, who knows. That house itself just has always looked to me like it has a freaking face on it. Like, it looks like a living yeah. entity of a house. 2012 film The Possession is an unconventional horror movie that involves rabbis, Judaism, and a cursed Jewish relic called Dybbuk Box that attaches itself like to a young girl. I like that movie, actually. A Dybbuk Box is a wine cabinet claimed to be haunted by a Dybbuk, which is a malevolent wandering spirit that enters and possesses the body of a living person until exercised. What happened on the set of The Possession left even the star of the movie, Jeffrey Dean Morgan, feeling very uneasy, and he already had a lot of experience acting in horror movies and shows under his belt. Supernatural. Some of the seemingly supernatural things that happened included lights exploding for no apparent reason, as well as chilly breezes wafting through closed sets for no particular reason. But the scariest incident occurred when the storage facility where all the movie props were being held caught fire and burned to the ground. A team of investigators concluded that the fire was not started from an electrical fault or arson, but the actual cause for the fire couldn't be determined. The Dybbuk box used in the movie, which played an important role in the movie, was destroyed in the fire, and the cast and crew later refused to allow the movie's producers to replace the Dybbuk box for fear that it was cursed. The Conjuring is a movie that's supposed to be based on the true story of the Perrin family, who claimed to be tormented by supernatural entities in the Rhode Island home in the 70s. While several of the family members spent time on the set during filming, the mother refused to go anywhere near it, as she was convinced that several unexplained events that plagued the filming of this movie on set were proof that the spirits hadn't finished with them yet. For instance, when members of the parent family were visiting, a furious gust of wind suddenly rose and seemed to swirl around them. However, nobody could see any movement in any of the trees just opposite them, movement you'd expect to see from any normal gust of wind. Just a couple days later, The hotel that the actors and movie crew were staying in caught fire and everyone had to be evacuated. And it doesn't end there. James Wan, the movie's director, recalls working late in his office one evening when his dog started growling at something. He would get up to investigate, but he couldn't find anything that would be antagonizing the dog. However, the dog had his sights on something across the room. It seemed he had focused on an unseen entity in one corner of the room. James took a break from working after this, having been legitimately freaked out. Vera Farmiga, who Hell played no. the role of a paranormal investigator. Dogs growling at shit that I can't see is one of those things that's just like, oh, I don't like that at all. Well, it's like, <laughs> you know, uh, Vega, like, runs around the house and just, like, stares at things that we can't see or, you know, we th- yeah, he thinks there and everything. Yeah, like, one night he came in my room, like, nobody else was really around. You were asleep. Um, the moment we say that, his head jets yeah, up and, and he's like, just looking over there at something. Yeah, he's like, something's over there. Yeah, but like, Vega came in my room and looked legitimately spooked and like sat shaking on my mouse pad, staring at the door for a very long time. Like, that's like the weirdest thing I've seen here. I'm just like, that kind of creeps me out. I kind of forgot about it. Like, I forced it out of my memory because it just sort of creeped me out too, you know? Yeah. Like, he was legitimately just, like, spooked, like, staring at the door. Like, I have no idea what freaked him out. 
Like, I thought it was maybe, like, Kathan coming home after being away for a few days, but, like, he wasn't actually... Like, he told me that he didn't see Vega when he came in, you know? So yeah. it was like he was already in his room and stuff, as far as I know. It was weird. Sounds weird. The Gator in the film refused to take the script home with her, as she said it made her feel uneasy. She also couldn't read it at night because she became paralyzed by fear whenever she tried. After a phone call discussion with James Wan, Vera opened her laptop screen and there were three digital claw marks from the upper right diagonal to the lower left. This wasn't the last time it happened though. Her next experience came a few months later, literally on the day that she completed work on The Conjuring. She returned home to upstate New York and when she woke up the next day, she discovered what she describes as three claw mark bruises across her thigh. In nineteen eighty, well, she's brave as shit because she kept working on that series after that. So, oh, it, this oh, here it is. Talk. Yep. The movie based on the Twilight Zone series was released during filming. Actor Vic Morrow was killed on the set. Deaths on movie sets have happened many times, but what makes this extra disturbing is the fact that Morrow appeared to predict his demise just a year earlier, a year before filming of the Twilight Zone movie began. Vic took out a $5 million life insurance policy on himself, explaining to friends and family members that he had a premonition something bad was going to happen to him on an upcoming movie. He had seen it in a dream he had. Unfortunately, Whoa, his premonition weird. came true, because while filming a scene involving a helicopter for the Twilight Zone, the helicopter crashed and decapitated him. Two child actors were also killed in the accident, which prompted a lengthy investigation and court case. It was later revealed in court that the movie's concept artist unintentionally drew an identical image in his sketches to what actually happened, a burned out helicopter in the middle of a river essentially foreshadowing the accident. The accident led to civil and criminal action against the filmmakers, which lasted nearly a decade. One of the children's fathers testified that he heard John Landis, the director, instructing the helicopter to fly lower. All four parents testified that they were never told that there would be helicopters or explosives on set and they had been assured that there would be no danger, only a lot of noise. John Landis and four other crew members would be found not guilty on the three charges of manslaughter, having been the first time a director was charged due to a fatality on a film set. Yeah. I'm again. not sure how I feel about that. Like, uh, on one hand, if he was, like, literally telling the helicopter to fly low or fly low or when they knew that he shouldn't, then that's really his fault. But on the other hand, like, I feel like the helicopter pilot, like it might, it might be in the hands of the helicopter pilot. The helicopter pilot might not have been well trained enough. Like, and that might be on the hands of someone who hired the helicopter pilot. I, so again, I really don't know without knowing well, the full again, details of the investigation. That's, that's the whole thing is they don't like, one one parent says that they heard John Landis say, fly lower, fly lower. Mm. But, again, they don't know. Like, we don't know. Yeah. Unless someone If that's was there. the only person that says that, then that could have just been something they just made up. Anyway, let's move on because... That's why I'm, whenever I said that we were going to shoot a short film, I was like, we need to make sure that we're as safe as humanly possible. I don't want anybody to get hurt. And we did. Make stuff, we, you know? we were extremely safe. I was like, I, I would feel like absolutely horrible if somebody got hurt because of something that I had an idea for, you know, so. Yeah. Well, and thankfully we got through it, uh, you know, no problems. I mean, yeah. the only person who was really at risk of getting hurt 100% was was Marcus. Marcus and Chad. Well, yeah, Marcus and Chad. But we had oh, the, and Lee. We had them doing things that they went through, you know, classes for, so. Yeah. And, I, and again, the whole thing with uh, Marcus is just, you know, he's, him and Chad are both tough as nails, so they can, they can take bumps, like, and Marcus wants to. That's the thing, because we're trying to orchestrate out a, a scene for the next one, and he's just like, bro, I want to fight somebody. And I'm like, like, how, how do you mean? He's like, dude, I want to get thrown around. I want to get slammed on the ground. I'm like, Marcus, like, I don't want to hurt you, man. He's just like, he's like, hurt me, bro. That's hurt why, me. Like, you think you can hurt me? <laughs> Basically, that's what he was like. Uh, anyway, let's keep going. The 1976 film The Omen Ooh, is another horror classic. No. Yeah, I've heard about this one. A young one. boy named Damien Thorne, who was replaced at birth by his father, unbeknownst to his wife, after their biological child died shortly after birth. 
As a series of mysterious events and violent deaths occur around the family and Damien enters childhood, they come to learn he's in fact the Antichrist. The film almost wasn't going to be completed due to an alleged curse that surrounded filming of the movie. So many horrible things happened on the set of The Omen that it can be comparable to the amount of bad things to happen in the movie. The tragedies began with the son of the lead actor Gregory Peck taking his own life as soon as filming began. The next incident was when a crew member suffered major injuries after getting into a car accident while driving to the set. But the tragedies didn't stop there. The scriptwriter's airplane was struck by lightning en route to the film's location. And if that weren't enough, an airplane in which Gregory Peck and the movie's executive producer were traveling in was also struck by lightning in a separate incident. Harvey Bernhard, the producer, was on location in Rome when he was almost hit by a bolt of lightning himself, and believe it or not, the horrible luck involving airplanes continued, and it got much worse. One day, the crew had decided to use a private airplane to get from one film location to the other. However, just after the plane took off with a number of the crew on board, something went wrong and the plane went down, crashing into a road and hitting a car, which then crashed at a high speed into another vehicle. All 11 people involved in the accident were killed. Another tragic death associated with the movie set was that of Liz Moore. John Richardson, the Omen special effects expert, was driving through the Netherlands with Liz Moore when they were involved in a terrible car accident. Richardson escaped with very minor injuries, but Moore's head was completely severed when a tire smashed into their vehicle. This incident was eerily reminiscent of a scene in The Omen, in which the character Keith Jennings, investigating Damien's supernatural origins, is decapitated by a sheet of glass that comes loose from a vehicle on a construction site. Richardson later reported that just before the crash, he passed a road sign that read Omen 66.6 kilometers. Oh. Make of that what you will. But there's no denying yeah. that it's not too far That one creeps me out. The production. Like, that, this one legitimately creeps me out because none of this was on set and due to negligence. Yeah, a like, lot of it. It's just a crazy amount of coincidences to the point where you're just kind of like, even the most skeptical person has to be like, that's fucking weird. Yeah. Like, that's just crazy that all that happened. Like, even if you're 100% skeptical, you have to admit, that's fucking crazy that that happened. Like, like Well, not just that, that but all down. of that, dude. That's what I'm saying. All, all of that stuff. All of that stuff happening. You have to admit that's crazy. Like, absolutely bonkers that so many things happened outside of the set on that. production of the Omen may have been cursed. That, or it was all just an outrageous coincidence. All that can be said for sure is that the Omen is a very iconic movie, and the chilling tales that surround its production have only helped to cement that legacy. So, like, in my opinion, like, two things happening is a coincidence. Three things happening is improbable. Four, five, and six, something weird is happening. Yeah, like, I'm something. skeptical on a lot of things, but if I was to ever be like, yes, I believe there was actually something weird going on with that movie. Like it could have been cursed or something. That yeah. would be the one thing where I would start to maybe be like, maybe I could 1% believe that like just a little bit. And I'm just kind of like, what the fuck? It only takes one dude. It, it uh, I, uh, for me, like it, it only takes one like incident like that for something like truly horror. Like again, someone died on that. Like, the accident with the girl getting her head cut off and then not only that but a bunch of other you know a bunch of like Gregory Peck's son taking his own life before you know like as the film was just starting mm -hmm. and can you imagine like Gregory Peck during that entire film you know yeah, just like having to deal with that emotional while dealing with that yeah I mean I've always looked at some actors as super professional and super like uh, just always just super like dedicated to their craft. I've seen method actors who completely immerse themselves in a character and answer as that character, you know, but there's a fine line between, you know, what, uh, Marlon Brando or what, uh, or what, um, uh, what's his name or what, uh, Jesus Christ! You keep farting over here, you little. <laughs> he keeps l ripping loose, and he just, was like, doing that in the kitchen earlier. I was like, "Why do you keep doing that while I'm in here?" He keeps just like, like oh God, mustard gas. I Jesus. normally share a little bit of my cheese with him, but I was like, "I'm not giving you any cheese, man. Like you, you've been farting too much. Yeah, you don't need I, any more cheese." 
But there's a level of, uh, with when it comes to method actors, you know, there's a fine line between, you know, Marlon Brando and uh, friggin' Daniel Day-Lewis versus Jared Leto and Jim Carrey. Because Jared Leto oh. on, you know, method acting on the set of Suicide Squad, acting like a fucking dingus. And then... Well, see, I, my problem with him method acting on that is the fact that he was doing things that I don't believe were in character for his character. Like, he was just being a dickhead. Yeah. And then being like, oh, method acting, like, using it as an excuse to just be a dickhead to me. Like, and then Jim Carrey, during the filming of uh, Man on the, Man on the Moon, uh, where he supposedly, as he put it, he was possessed by the spirit of Andy Kaufman. He was just like, yeah, he's like, oh, yeah, yeah, he's like... He was like, oh, yeah, during that, I, I wasn't Jim Carrey. I was Andy. I was Andy Kaufman. I'm like, Jim, I get that you wanted to be in character. But his actions on set were just, it It was like that of a child. You know, just like going, it's like, all right, Jim, we have to go shoot. He's like, I don't want to today. He's like, Jim, we have to get in set. He's like, I guess you're just going to have to carry me. And he like dead, like, you know, does like the dead weight uh, play and they had to literally carry him to set to put him to put him in the scene and everything. It's like yeah, it's like there's a level of like all right, and then there's like dude, like you're not being professional anymore. Yeah, and everyone else who worked on the set with him said that you know his actions were not remis- reminiscent of Andy Kaufman in the slightest. It's like uh, they talked about. Um on the Sunny podcast, how when they first met Danny DeVito, like he would just go off on tangents that they were kind of like, I'm not really sure if he's in character right now or if he's just being Danny, like, but like they were, you know, they didn't have a problem with him, you know, like all that kind of stuff's understandable. Like if you're just saying some random crazy shit, like that's one thing, you know, but like when you're actually making life difficult on the people around you, then that's a completely different thing. Yeah. And, and the thing is, Andy was always someone who a lot of people saw as a, you know an anti comedian. For instance, Andy Kaufman had a had a bit where he got up on stage and instead of telling jokes, he literally just sat down at a table and ate vanilla ice cream for like <laughs> five minutes. <laughs> that, that was his bit. He's I mean, for a- five minutes, I don't know. Like, uh, I mean, after a couple minutes, like, I think that'd be pretty funny. Like, you know, but. well, a lot of people said it was his, just his natural mannerisms that got through because, again, he got up there and he didn't do the stereotypical thing, you know, where you know he puts the uh, apron on or the bib uh, and you know puts it in his shirt. Instead, he just starts digging in, and then uh, he gets he brings his head up and he's just like. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, again, just so many different uh, things that Kaufman did that basically cemented him as a comedy legend. I smelled that one. <laughs> yeah, huh, yeah. Doesn't smell too good, does it? You have a tummy ache, buddy. Maybe he does. I know I why. Know. You need to stop eating cat turds. <laughs> well, all right. These were uh, horrifying things that happened on horror movie sets. By Mr. Nightmare. If you want to see more from Mr. Nightmare, be sure to uh, click uh, his name in the title of the video. And I guess until next time, everybody, signing off, I'm Nate. I'm Nick. See you later. Peace. (laughs) 